I'm Kat Oriel, a Forbes Breaking News reporter. Today, I'm here with Governor Westmore of Maryland. Governor, thank you so much for joining me today. It's my joy. It's good to be with you. Congratulations on winning your election. You are the first black governor of Maryland. Can you tell me about your background and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, you know, I, I say the, uh, this journey was pretty improbable. Uh, and, and not just my political journey. I mean, we started this campaign, I was polling at 1%. <laughs> so, and I was running against statewide elected officials and cabinet secretaries and the former head of the DNC. Uh, but I, I, it was also just a, a, a life journey that was, that was improbable, where I was, uh, I'm the, the son of an immigrant uh, single mom. And, uh, and I watched my dad die in front of me when I was just three years old. I, uh, you know, I ended up having handcuffs on my wrist by, by the time I was 11 and was sent away to military school. And that, uh, when I was 13 years old, I uh, had a mandatory year that ended up changing, uh, changing the trajectory of my life. And so then when I ended up finishing high school, actually I joined the army. I was an army officer uh, and, uh, and also a, uh, a paratrooper in the military and, uh, and also been a small business owner, worked in finance and a small business owner. And after a successful exit in 2017, I became CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, which is one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in the country. And it was uh, with that experience, never having held elected office, uh, the graduate of a two-year college, uh, that I decided that I was going to uh, going to run for governor of my birth state and my home state, and I'm just thankful that the people of the, the people of Maryland, Maryland gave me the honor to serve as their 63rd governor. You've had a very vast career, and I'm wondering if you think that because you haven't held elected office before, that gave you an advantage in the election. And do you think that's going to help you ultimately in your term as governor? Well, you know, I think one thing I, you know, remind people is that uh, even when I was running, uh, I would say on the campaign trail, do you know what the states of Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, uh, at that time, Maryland, uh, Virginia, uh, you know, uh, all had in common? And the answer was the first elected office that that governor, that the governor of those states held was governor. Because I think when people are looking at governors, they look for chief executives. They look for people that have a history of running things. And I would say that, you know, that I would put my executive experience against anybody else in this race because I've had the chance to lead soldiers in combat as a, as a, as a paratrooper and, and, the, and the captain of the United States Army. I've had a chance to lead when I started, uh, started a, a successful small business that was helping students uh, who are first generation students go to and through higher education. I've had a chance to lead when I, uh, you know, ran, uh, ran a, a poverty fighting organization where just my, in my time as CEO, we raised and allocated over $600 million going to the most effective organizations in, in, the, in the country that was focusing on, on ending poverty. Uh, and so I think that that has really given me an understanding of not just what it takes to be an executive and how to lead, uh, but also how to work across lines. And I remember, you know, we would go, uh, go campaigning and I would go all around the state and I go to a lot of areas where there weren't a lot of Democrats and people would say, you know, you're going a lot of places where there's not a lot of Democrats. And I say, yeah, but there's a lot of Marylanders and I plan on being their governor mm -hmm. too. And that's exactly how, uh, that's exactly how I've begun the administration. It's exactly how our team maneuvers and moves. And it's why I think even in the early days of our administration, while we've been so successful uh, in order to get bipartisan approval, for a lot of the measures that we're pushing forward. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't governor today, what would you be doing? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, and it's one I haven't thought about <laughs> in a couple of years, because once I decided that uh, that I was going to run for governor, I put out of my mind what was going to happen if I didn't win. Yeah, uh, <laughs> very The fair. only thing I was focused on was yep. we're if we're going to do this, then we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And we are going to run harder than everyone else. We're going to outwork everybody. We're going to go everywhere. And uh, and I think people saw that where even if you look at the election results that we had, you know, we ended up uh, we ended up winning with the largest margin in close to 40 years. You know, I received more individual votes than any person who'd run for governor in the history of the state of Maryland. Uh, and the way we were able to do that was because we didn't just win a group. Right. We didn't just win Democrats. We won Democrats, independents and a good chunk of Republicans. We didn't just win African-Americans. 
We want people across the board. We want people who said that crime was their number one issue. And we want people who said the economy was our number one issue. We won veterans and veteran families, which for a Democrat is very unusual. Uh, you know, so we really ended up building a really powerful coalition that I think made uh, made our, our not just the run very successful, but I think which has really given us a lot of tailwind uh, to make our administration very successful and even 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 in its early days. I'd like to go more into that. Can you tell me more about this politics of the state? How did Maryland go from a conservative governor with Larry Hogan to getting the first black governor in state history? You know, I, I think that the thing uh, that I, I really wanted to do is, you know, we, we staked our campaign where I said uh, the North Star for our campaign is going to be work, wages and wealth. We're going to create economic pathways. We're going to focus on economics uh, because I knew that that was going to be the core of everything we look to get done. And in the first days of the administration, I said to the people of the state, we're going to make the North Star of this administration work, wages and wealth. There's a measure of consistency that I really tried to drive and our administration has really tried to drive about the work that we are going to be able to do. And so when we talk about work, uh, it means creating pathways to address the, the, the historic vacancies that we continue to see in the state of Maryland, where there's 10,000 vacancies uh, in state government right now. Uh, where we have basic services that are not being performed because people are not performing them. And that's impacting everyone from public safety to unemployment insurance to uh, to the Department of Parole and Probation and the Department of Corrections. So we have to be able to get people back to work. We have to be able to address the fact that Maryland right now, despite having remarkable assets, is currently 35th in this country in unemployment. If you look at economic activity, we're the 47th most difficult place in this country to start a business that over the past eight years, the national economy, national GDP has increased by 23%. Maryland's has increased by 11. So we're falling behind in the country over these past eight years. And so my focus has been, we've got to get our economic engine going again in the state of Maryland. And that includes not just the work piece, also the wages piece. And that means being able to ensure that we are we are eliminating this idea that we have people who are working jobs and in some cases multiple jobs and still living at or below a poverty line and increasing wages for our workers. And when we say wealth, it really means creating an ownership society, right? It means giving people the ability to own more than they owe, giving people the ability to, to, to pass something off to their children and grandchildren besides debt. And so if we can really focus on creating a pathway for work, wages and wealth, this is going to be Maryland's decade. And I think that's really how we try to approach it. And I think that's why you saw the state in such an overwhelming fashion uh, back, uh, back our candidacy. And with the current rough economic times and more ahead, would you support any cuts to government spending? And if so, where? Well, I think one thing you see in our budget is, uh, is, uh, is we can be both bold and ambitious without being reckless. Where if you look at our budget, we made historic investments in our public education system. I, I, I became a, uh, um, I, I introduced a bill and used an executive order that is going to ask Maryland to be the first state in this country to offer a service year option for all high school graduates where they have a chance to have a year of service to the state of Maryland, however they wanna do it in the environment and education in justice reform and serving veterans. Uh, and, and I also did that while also saying and proposing that I wanna have $200 million in tax cuts, that mm -hmm. I wanna make this the most attractive state for retiring military veterans by essentially exempting over 90% of military veterans, uh, upwards of $40,000 of their military retirees should be exempt uh, and, and really move this to make this the place where military veterans want to stay. That you know we ask for tax cuts for lower and middle income families. And so I think that one thing that we've been really pushing on is we can be more effective and more efficient and more transparent as a government. We can ask our government to be able to provide better support for people. And at the same time, be fiscally prudent by calling for $200 million in tax cuts that you don't have to choose, that we can and we will do both. And then what I really try to show is that in this moment, Maryland can lead. And so you've talked about your experience as a young person who ran away from law enforcement. And I was wondering what your other major 
um, policies are? Is that policing? Is it reproductive health? And how has your experience as um, that experience that you've talked about as a young kid, how has that influenced your policies around policing? Yeah, uh, you know, I um, when I look at the budget that we've that we've laid out, uh, where we have uh, we you know asked for an increase of 122 million dollars in support for local law enforcement, uh, 17 and a half million dollars going towards Baltimore City alone, uh, where we've uh, increased funding for the Maryland uh, Analysis and and and, uh, and Coordination Center, uh, Coordination and Analysis Center, something called MCAC. Uh, which really focuses on intelligence sharing and best practice sharing between jurisdictions to focus on things like getting these illegal guns off of our streets, getting and keeping these violent offenders out of our neighborhoods, uh, making sure that we can really go after organized crime. Uh, and so I, I'm very clear that we are going to support our you know, law enforcement and we're going to make sure we're recruiting top quality professionals into the field of law enforcement. I'm also very clear on this, though. We're not going to arrest or militarize our way out of it. And, uh, you know, we've got long term challenges and, and root cause challenges that we still have to address as a society. And it is it's never lost to me that that, you know, I am uh, I am decades removed from being an 11 year old with handcuffs on my wrists in the back of a police car. And you couldn't have told that 11 year old kid that, you know what, one day you're going to be the governor of a state, I wouldn't have believed you. And we have a responsibility to keep our community safe. We have a responsibility to make sure that, and I believe the number one responsibility of any chief executive is to keep your community safe. But we also have a responsibility to make sure that for that 11 year old kid who's coming up right now in Maryland, that when we say you can do anything to know that we're telling them the truth, mm -hmm. to know that that's not, that, you know, that, that that's not hyperbole. Uh, and so we can do both of those two things mm -hmm. simultaneously. And that really has been the focus yeah. and the structure of our administration. And speaking about public safety and national safety, another initiative that you've been spearheading is moving the FBI headquarters potentially to PG County. Why does the FBI headquarters need to be moved in the first place? Well, I mean, the, the, the federal government made the decision that they were going to uh, make the move for the for the FBI building, uh, you know, now uh, about a decade ago. Uh, and they had criteria that was laid out. And this really became a legacy defining decision that really falls under the Biden administration now. And we're excited that it's the Biden administration that's going to going to make this final decision. And we believe and, and the data reinforces it that if they stay to the criteria that were laid out, that we're going to focus on things like cost. And right now we know that uh, that it shoot by choosing Prince George's County in the state of Maryland, that that is going to save taxpayers over a quarter of a billion dollars because we have land and site that is prepared and ready, uh, unlike unlike the uh, the the opposing area in uh, in Northern Virginia, that we know there are transportation assets in the state of Maryland that are ready uh, to be mobilized, and that on transportation, another key criteria that we believe we win. That on equity, that uh, that if we're saying that that equity and the Biden administration has been very clear that equity is going to be a core dating criteria about how they want their agencies to look to make decisions, um, that we know that Prince George's County, a majority African American county, uh, has also been historically neglected when it comes to federal supports and federal assets. And if you look at even from the from the uh, economic competitiveness front, of the top 150 uh, jurisdictions in the in the in this country. Uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, in terms of economic competitiveness, is number two. Prince George's County, Maryland, is 107. So there isn't there there you know the argument of which jurisdiction would benefit most from this is very clear. And on another criteria, when it comes to mission, the future, and the FBI has also stated that part of, a, a large part of their future mission is going to be cyber threats and cyber terrorism. Well, the state of Maryland is the home to the NSA and Fort Meade and U.S. Cyber Command. And the number one university in this country that focuses on cyber is the University of Maryland. The number two university is Johns Hopkins, which is also in Maryland. So we feel very good that on the basis of the argument uh, and, and, and on just data, that the right decision is going to be for the FBI building to be in the state of Maryland. And I know both in the state of Maryland, 
but also uh, but also people around the country who care about equity, who care about the right decision being made on this, who care about the statement that this is going to uh, that this is going to make. Uh, you've got a lot of people around the country, not just in the state of Maryland, who are watching this decision closely. Out of the topics that we've discussed so far, is one of those topics or another one? What keeps you up at night? What is the biggest issue that you find in your state that is the most pressing? You know, I um, I, I think about I think about this journey that we're uh, you know that we're collectively on, and 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 I think about where. There is a, uh, you know, that we have a, an opportunity as a state to really get this right. And when I say get this right, I mean to really focus on creating measurements of, of economic growth that everyone in the state can benefit from and not just some. That we have a chance to make our communities safe uh, and people have a right to feel safe in their own communities in their own skin. Uh, that we have a chance to address the, the ravages of, of, of climate change and particularly when you look at the geography and the topography of Maryland. Uh, you know, this is not just a, a future issue. This is a very clear now issue for the people in the state of Maryland. Uh, you know, we have got a collection of challenges uh, that we've got to be able to do, that we can have a 21st century education system for all of our kids. Um, and I also think about this moment of, of urgency. And so when you ask what keeps me up at night, it's um, it's the fact that I know, and, and it's because I actually have a clock that sits on that sits on my desk, that I've got 1,418 days left in my first term. That, that there's a level of impermanence that all of us move in. That, uh, that this is not my seat, that this is the seat of the governor that I just happen to occupy in this moment. And we're gonna make 1,418 days count. And we are gonna make every single moment count. And I think that's why we, our administration is moving so fast and moving with a sense of intentionality in everything that we do, uh, because I know that if we can do all these things, create a 21st century education system, really focus on keeping people safe in our communities, making sure that we can be economically competitive and also economically equitable, and that's not a choice, we can do both. If we do all those things, this is going to be Maryland's decade, and we're gonna make sure that it's just that. Yes, and looking towards the future, are you planning on running for another term or seeking higher office, such as the Senate? <laughs> no, I, 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 I plan on running for another term. I'm excited about leading the state of Maryland. I love my job. I love the people of this state. And, uh, and this is going to be Maryland's decade. And I'm excited to help us to get there. So if President Biden doesn't decide to run in 2024, you would not run? I am not going to run. <laughs> I am excited about supporting President Biden, who has been wonderful. Uh, to us here in the state of Maryland. Uh, he is, you know, in the, just in the past four weeks, I think he's been in Maryland three times. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about the fact that, you know, the first time that he was here, we announced a joint partnership that's gonna bring 30,000 jobs to the state of Maryland. Uh, I'm excited about the fact that, uh, that we're already talking about and making investments that's gonna increase broadband expansion, where by the end of my first term, I want the entire state to be covered. Uh, when it comes to equitable and accessible uh, and affordable broadband. This is going to be Maryland's time. I'm excited to have the Biden administration as a partner in that. And uh, and I look forward to supporting the Biden administration in their, in their reelection. Great. Governor Westmore, thank you so much for joining me.